everybody. So roughly about eight years ago, I was working for a federal agency um, as part of another consulting outfit, and uh, there was a big project. It was, uh, I don't know if you've, some of you have heard of SCAP. They were trying to basically implement and use SCAP and, and uh, use XCCDF checks and oval checks and to check over a million nodes across an entire agency. And um, you know, it seemed like a pretty monstrous and, and pretty badass effort. So I, you know, I was like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And uh, naturally, like any big organization or enterprise, even though it's government, uh, they gravitated towards the tools, right? Because the tools are going to solve everyone's problem. And so um, fast forward, you know, and kind of relevant to the topic of this talk is how there's broken threat models out there. And the, 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 what happened with that federal agency is that they invested a lot of money, a lot of our money, a lot of your money, uh, in, in trying to solve a, a risk problem. They wanted to find out what was the extent to which they were vulnerable across all platforms. It didn't matter where they were deployed, if there was in lower environments or production environments or you know, endpoint computing environments. They, were, they just threw everything into one big pile and decided to light a match of US dollars and invest in a technology that ultimately never got fully adopted. So as I kind of look out into the lights and I try to you know, uh, differentiate the suits from the, the black hats out there, some of you might actually be practitioners within an enterprise. And this sort of story where there's a lot of capex and investment might actually resonate. And it happens over and over and over and over again. So, I begin with this, and this is really the crux of what I see, you know, having been in the industry for a little bit. And also, I just spent time, I got called in, you know, many of you know that I'm a pinch hitter for today. Uh, so I hope to do uh, you all justice, but I was called in on Wednesday to, to come and do this talk. But I wanted to re revisit some of the prior talks. So I looked at, you know, Joe from uh, back then, he was with uh, DHS. Um, and then I looked at uh, Bruce Schneier, and I looked at, uh, also, um, uh, I'm having a, a memory lapse, Gary McGraw. So all of them had phenomenal things to say. And you know, th these are talks that have happened over years in different cities, and it's the same problem. So this, this title, this talk, is really meant to commissioning OWASP members for real change in AppSec. It's the end of the day. It's been a long week. You guys are looking forward to get home. So I'm trying to kind of pump everybody up to take some of the content, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the talks that you've, you've attended and actually weaponize it within your, whether you're a consultant, whether you're a practitioner, but to actually do something for change. I, I was, 10 years ago, I wasn't managing the OWASP chapter. I wasn't founder of a company. And uh, I didn't write anything, uh, maybe a blog or two. But every one of you here, that has passion and for being here, for taking time away from your, your personal lives and your professional lives, you, I sense that you have the same passion. I put this thing up here, two things can destroy any relationship, and that's unrealistic expectations and poor communication because security prof professionals are plagued with having bad communication. And not in the sense of delivery, like in the sense of like, you know, being able to articulate something clearly, concisely, and make a point, Security professionals, technology professionals for that matter, developers are extremely intelligent and very articulate because they're reading tons of information and their, their vocabulary is far better than some of the uh, professionals in other industries. Where we lack in communication is being able to empathize our point of view around securing anything, whether it be securing an application or a platform or a mobile device or a cloud component, being able to articulate the value of that remediation or that or baking that security effort in. And that's the biggest challenge. We have a, a big problem. And that, that um, you know, that leads to false expectations. You know, the security groups within traditional Fortune 500 organizations are not the life of the party in the sense that they're, uh, not that they're not interesting, but in the sense that they're always the bearer of bad news. And so we have a historical problem of rendering security information or risks, that word that is commonly used incorrectly. Um, it's, it's basically just being thrown around. So we've shot ourselves in the foot. So how do we rebound 
And how do we rebound in an OWASP way? Because, you know, and I've been with the OWASP, and I've run the Atlanta chapter, and I've done talks and been a part of projects, and I love the international organization for a lot of different reasons, because they really are, they always have been looking to make a change, looking to foster change. So this talk begins with looking at a lot of storytelling around true risk dilemmas, problems, threat models that have been broken, threat models that have been attempted to be created within different organizations, startup companies, across multiple different sectors, but have failed to reach some level of effective mitigation. Operationalizing threat modeling is hard. The common problems that people say is that it takes way too much time. Developers sometimes can't wrap their, their heads around the time suck that it has when they're already constrained to basically fulfill their project deliverables over a short window. So hopefully after this, I can inspire you all to some, somehow see how this all can be catalyzed. And ironically, with some of the OWASP projects that have been flagship for a while, or that have been even talked about or demoed this week. Well, let's begin with risk. So there's a formula for risk. And the generic one is risk equals threat times vulnerability times impact. And there's usually a probability of threat that goes along as a coefficient for threat. But not a lot of people understand this formula. Because when we speak about finding bugs, and the Gary McGraw talk really stood out because he talked about how we're very bug happy. We're, we're like bug, per, we're parading bugs everywhere we go. We have SAS, we have DAS, we have IAS, we have RAS, we have all these different alphabet soups finding more bugs. So our messaging to our internal customers, or if you're consulted in external customers is, I got more crap for you to fix. So as a result, they hate us even more. So context helps to fix that crap. And one of that is, what is this crap causing me in terms of a pain point? Can you monetize this? Can you actually articulate to me how me as, uh, let's say I'm in uh, retail, you know, obviously the financial impact of credit card handling, or let's say I'm in energy, and uh, uptime, uptime of my bulk energy systems is paramount for my customers. How can you speak to me that certain vulnerabilities or bugs that we are all finding in what we do is actually material risk related to the operations? And that's where we still fall short as a community. Now, I somehow cheated. I was, uh, my background, I went to Cornell and I got an uh, international finance degree and I got a lot of good business background. And, um, and a lot of the roles that I had at different enterprises, you know, international banks and whatnot, really allowed me to understand and empathize and articulate security in a way that made them understand why they should listen, not just remediate, because forget about remediation. Let's build in security quicker, faster, better. So that was one of the reasons that inspired me to write this process for attack simulation and threat analysis. It's a risk-centric threat modeling methodology. And for all those that are out there that are thinking, you know, uh, well, this is another agenda, another methodology, you can take this and you can cut it up as much as you like, build your own, snap it off like Legos, and make something that works. And I think that was the same message that Gary McGraw also had in his keynote uh, I think it was in Cambridge, but um, the point is, is that we need to have a process, a process that makes sense, that can serve as a wrapper for all the different security activities that we do. Pen testing, source code reviews, static analysis, uh, you know, vulnerability scanning, um, you know, architectural reviews, uh, you know, what about threat monitoring? You know, the one aspect is, you know, we'll talk about this here, if you look at, you know, the different stages of, of PASTA, one of the things that differentiates PASTA as an acronym to what it, the, the risk-centric threat model is that it incorporates two really key different things, business impact and threat intel. And if you look at other types of approaches, it, you're, it's called a threat model for a reason. If you're using other types of, I'll use the word methodologies loosely, and you're not incorporating threats, which could be harvested from your SecOps team. Their eyes on glass, looking at alerts, at the application layer, platform layer, network layer, and how are you able to translate those alerts into your threat model? It's a threat model. So where are you getting your threats? 
if you're getting your threats from a list, you know, I love OWASP, and I just spent, I think, a couple of seconds talking about how I love OWASP, but the OWASP top 10 is not going to cut it for you. It'll be a good guide if you're totally lost and you want to see what the world is doing and, and, and uh, you know, the, the OWASP top 10, at least from my perspective, is, is, is not uh, fully evidence-based where it taps on the shoulders of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tools out there and say, hey, we've harvested a million alerts to say that SQL injection, blind SQL injection, you know, um, different forms of cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery. We're, we've mined all this data, and here it is, over 12 months. That's, that's definitely a study. And maybe we'll get there. And I've always wanted that we could get there. But the point goes back to the threat. What are you using for your threat basis? Because we want to go back to that formula of how you're solving for R how you're solving for risk. So there was a, you know, before this, uh, I actually had another presentation for work related, and there is a startup company medical manufacturer device, IoT. And it's great because they're a small company. And I love dealing with smaller companies because uh, it gives me a chance to really, it's a, it's a fresh canvas across the board. You know, from threat modeling to security hardening, I mean, you name it, it's a fresh canvas. So being able to articulate the value proposition of why you should build in security earlier is phenomenal. This particular group and company uh, that's California-based, interesting cosmetic technology product that is IoT. And uh, the short of it is this. One of the questions that came up is, how is it that the threats that you're, you've researched for our platform, for our company, is actually going to be you know, of, of impact? And, and correlate this to me to my application. And that's one of my favorite questions, because you want to take the threats that you're harvesting, that you're putting your own stethoscope to the ground and seeing what's out there, and you want to correlate it to your technology footprint your frameworks, your open libs, your, your binaries, third-party binaries, third-party software, and correlating threats or vulnerabilities that have been exploited and that have been reported, and correlating that to your model. Because that shows precedence. And then you correlate that to threat motives. What do people in healthcare, what do adversarial groups and individuals in healthcare want? They want PHI for identity theft. They want to kill people. It's true. With implantables and wearables, they want to do things for the lults. So you have to look at what is the precedence of actual breaches, actual incidents for the market that you're in, or the sub-market sub that you're in, in order that your messaging for building security in can be more topical. Because once you start to make recommendations, maybe from OWASP uh, standards, or ASVS, or security, no security knowledge framework, then the things that you're cherry picking from those references, those great projects, can actually be material for risk reduction because you're addressing a real threat. So I wrote this book, and uh, there was already a brief introduction. The only reason I bring this up is simply for context. The rest of this talk is simply just me storytelling, fireside chatting. I'm sharing what I've seen. I'm sure you've seen just as much, if not more, and in fact, after this, one of the great things I like about OWASP, if you're not part of the Slack channels that exist, we're getting and we're continuing the threat modeling conversation for evolving more references, more templates, more projects so that people can go back and implement any type of threat modeling, whether it be a risk-centric approach or otherwise. But I bring that up simply just for context. The different industries and things that have been seen and witnessed, there's a common denominator, and that's that we're not building security in earlier. You know, here we are 2017, and it's still post-implementation testing. Chasing people with JIRA tickets, remedy tickets, uh, ServiceNow tickets, whatever ticketing system du jour, it's the same crap. You know, it's like, almost like we're, we're collectors, you know, knocking on the door, asking for remediation dollars. And it's, it's what really kind of reduces the value that we actually bring. So threat modeling is, is an aspect that I actually love because if you look at the different phases uh, of where you want to tackle hardening your business logic, hardening your uh, integrated third-party software, you can look at the design. 
you can look at the, uh, the different use cases and see how those use cases might actually beget abuse cases or misuse cases by your own users or by nefarious actors. And so this is the, 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 the goal and achievement that we want to do. And there's the tools already that um, OWASP has produced to really facilitate a lot of these phases, regardless of where you are. Typically, when I look at these seven stages here, you know, people always ask me, well, what stage goes to what? And try to correlate it to a gen generic SDLC. Stage one and two, I call a discovery phase. It's just trying to figure stuff out. How important is this platform, this, this, this solution to the business? Is this a revenue producing application? Is this one that's regulated? Is this one where the FTC is gonna crawl up our rear, rear end if we don't take care of some, of, some you know, PII? Or is, do we have some vendor dependencies? The other, th so two is, you know, there's, a, there's a trite saying that you can't really protect what you don't know. And that was a problem going back to the federal example. They didn't know the extent of vulnerable or ac actually technology stacks they had in their environment. They were amazed to find you know, still uh, Windows XP, and, uh, which is I guess not so uncommon back then for, for federal, but a lot of different platforms that they didn't provide authorization for as part of their CNN and onboarding process. So do you know enough about your, even for your, if you're a part of a development team, do you know the, the, the application components at the you know, UI level, the presentation layer? What about the application tier or the backend database tier? Are there cloud components or APIs that you're interfacing with? So enumeration is part of number two. Three is really putting it all together. Dissecting and understanding the call flow, understanding the protocols. Um, I was really researching a lot lately on threat modeling for uh, these different protocols for IoT. And there's this one protocol that it's, you know, it's amazing how things change and how things evolve. Um, and it's COAP. And it's a protocol that's lightweight that actually uh, rides on top of, uh, it's, it's basically HTTP integrated, but you can't secure it with TLS because it's basically um, sending datagrams versus you know, TCP packets. And what's interesting is that you can use other types of mitigations, you know, like uh, secure uh, UDP um, uh, mediums. There's a, a protocol, I think it's uh, DTLS. Um, that can be used as an underlying uh, component. But the point going back to application decomposition and technology enumeration is, do you know your stack? Do you know the components within your application? Do you know how they work? Have you taken the time to understand as a security practitioner the RFC uh, publications around that spec? You know, that's the great thing about um, you know, some of the team members that I have is that you know, I'm, I'm getting old, so I'm the has-been, but they're definitely in it. Right? They're all about, how does this protocol work? Let me start there. How does this technology work? Because I want to abuse the hell out of it as a breaker or as a black hat. And that is the, the right mentality. I mean, if, if the, for those that are out there hiring practitioners out there, it is tough to find that psychological trait of a cyber criminal. It's very hard, and it's very much needed. But digressing back into the topic of threat model stories, um, you know, the threat modeling usage is very much broken. Oftentimes, you know, there will be individuals that will say, yeah, I just built this threat model. And, you know, a traditional IT person in software development say, well, this is a DFD. You know, or security practitioners should say, well, where are your threats? And which ones do I, th do, do, which ones do I handle first? It's good to break down your application environments. It's good to basically establish trust zones and trust boundaries understand what the calls are and what the protocols are, understand the levels of authentication between components, and if there's implicit trust factors that exist from, you know, this is actually a uh, mobile component. We, we do a lot of mobile testing, and a long time ago, some of our guys found some of the uh, implicit trusts that exist with Android-related applications and having a field day with that. So being able to threat model and find information and vulnerabilities in design is amazing. So the main crux here that's missing is funneling context into our threat models. And that's why the whole system is broken in the sense that those that are spewing threat modeling rhetoric need to look at context. 
What's your threat context? What's your business impact context? You want this context because it makes it topical for interfacing with developers so that they know what to prioritize, or product managers, or project managers. And so these are all the things that you want to be able to, to understand. So overall, as we you know, look at a threat landscape, you know, meshing with possible impact and you know, systems that might be in scope, you, you overlay these and you get this, you know, kind of this uh, overlap of attack, where if certain parts of your technology footprint do get attacked, and those technology components actually map to, let's say, uh, high impact scenarios of data loss or issuing service level credits as a service provider or some sort of re regulatory nightmare, then you want to be able to correlate the function of your software assets, your libraries, your frameworks, to the actual um, impact, and then so that you can better you know, foster uh, remediation. But it, like I said, it's, it's not even about the remediation. It's about planning for a better design. One of the things that I like to, that I see that's missing oftentimes as a deliverable is, as an, as, is an attack tree. So I like attack trees, and some of you might use kill chains, but it's just a, a visual way so that the, the people that are developing products, whether it be a consumer electronic device or anything else, actually understand the sequence of, first of all, the motive. Who, the, the common question is, who would do this? And you're exemplifying it. And you're demonstrating it with evidence. So it's evidence-based threat modeling. And then you're actually mapping it with attack patterns. You can use KPEC as a great resource. And you're basically mapping those attack patterns to nodes on your tree that are the, the vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the application. And you map those weaknesses to the application components in your architectural layer. And so it's all about messaging. That's what I started out talking about, is messaging. We have a messaging problem. And sometimes these sort of illustrations can help to, to improve the message. I'm going to skip this slide and talk about roles for a second. Oftentimes, and I cut this slide off deliberately because I wanted everyone to kind of look at the font because it's kind of small. So real story, enterprise, uh, you know, large multinational company trying to really have a toll gate for threat modeling, but doing it differently and doing it the right way. They're not doing it, you know, they're doing it early, early, early. And they're trying to basically um, have secure design reviews early uh, during the, the conceptual design phases of a given product that's being developed. And they, they, you know, they, they want to be able to have certain people involved. And if you've ever, you know, if you've, like a, a very large company has very centralized corporate functions, and then they have business units. And so this provides kind of a racy model for who does what across various stages of threat modeling that's risk-centric. But it's important to basically leverage the collaborative aspect of, of threat modeling to understand what the ultimate risk reduction goal is. A project manager or a product manager is going to have a tough time defending the two to three to four hour increment in their overall development life cycle if you're providing a value that's going to save them remediation time that's going to be 10 times that post-implementation. That's one. Number two is the, the preemptive value that they might be saving in terms of egg on their face if the product basically was flawed and got a bad rap sheet. Because there's really difficult to quantify bad PR that would be sustained by that. So preemptively handling that and translating a security requirement into almost a functional requirement that gets you know, understood by the development audience is an easy win. Developers don't want to work on n minus 2 version of their code base. They want, to, they want to work on the latest and greatest and the hottest thing. So having to go back to fix old stuff is just really lame. So there's people involved that can make different activities accountable. And you know, t let's, you know, going into the tail aspect of how do we integrate what we do and who we are as a global organization into improved security by design, improved threat modeling, improved risk understanding. Hopefully, 
you know, the, 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 one of the two things that I, I've talked about already is the lack of impact context in that risk formula, the lack of uh, threat information. Like, not the bullshit of, like, subscribe to this threat feed and get inundated with, like, you know, gigabytes and terabytes of just meaningless threat data, but something that you can actually operationalize within you and your teams. And, it, and, and uh, there's, there's tons of ways of doing that. But so ultimately, as, as an organization within OWASP, you know, we want to be able to leverage the different projects and tools in order so that if we look at a DFD like this, and we look at the orange boxes, and we look at the attack vectors that are coming in to the different you know, architectural layers, the natural question is, what can we do earlier to secure a more resilient application? that fosters better authentication, better, uh, better authorization models, better crypto, you know, implementation of crypto, um, et cetera. And let's, let's dovetail into the OWASP projects that exist, and there's tons. I could really spend 30 minutes on each one. The Juice Shop, Bjorn in Germany, he, he did an awesome job. He's a really passionate guy. I loved working with him when I was in Europe for AppSec EU and then in the London uh, Summit. And, uh, you know, this is kind of like the, the latest, you know, CTF, B2C, um, e-commerce deliberately flawed site where you can learn and you can understand how to hack a, a flawed application. But what I wanted to do is I got with him and I said, let me build a pasta simulation. And I did, but it's only 90% complete because I slacked. So I'm going to finish that actually next week. And uh, fortunately, the great thing about OWASP is that you know, there's global people that can make you accountable and, and shame you on Slack in order to kind of get you to, to, to finish what you promised, so that's great. So, you know, I, I encourage, you know, everyone, you know, once it's out, to see if this is something that you could use. See if this is something that you could build. See if this is something that you could actually reboot because you've actually incorporated, you know, something else into the, uh, into the process. One of the things in the book is this risk-based threat modeling uh, and uh, this kind of blind threat modeling idea. And I had this stepping scale because I was thinking about this when I was writing the book a couple years ago, and I was thinking, if people, and a lot of people don't understand threat models, if people just were to do some preemptive hardening on, the te on, on, on two main ingredients, the technology that they're using, that's supporting the use cases for their application. And if they were to correlate the countermeasures that might exist with the cheat sheets. The cheat sheets alone would provide some good preemptive mitigation. So I call that blind threat modeling. You're really kind of trying to not understand the threat context or even impact of what could happen. You're preemptively saying, these are the components that we have. And based upon you know, these guidance and, and these references, these are the bad things that could happen. And this is where something like an OWASP top 10 you know, may be of use. But the only reason I was given OWASP top 10 or any other, you know, um, and I'm not the only one. I mean, you know, this is, goes to the SANS, you know, CAG or any other list is they don't know your organization. You know, I, I, I run a consulting company. I, one of the first things I tell all my consultants is, is like, first thing you do is shut the hell up and listen. listen. Do you understand what these people are selling? How are they making money? If you don't get in, your, in their shoes, let's just give it to somebody else. We have to, and this is really kind of a, a good tip for everyone, because once, once we understand what's at stake, we can convey the value of what we're trying to mitigate. I didn't mean that to rhyme, sorry. So this is the ecology of OWASP. You know, you have awareness projects, training projects, and Let's talk about how this could all fit in into better understanding risk, applying it to a threat model, in this case a risk-centric one. You have the CISO project. The co-author for PASTA is Marco Morana. He's been based in um, London for a long time. Now he's moved back to Florida, just in time for Irma. And uh, he's, he's doing good. Just saw him the other day. And he's leading the CISO project, uh, along with the team of six other people, uh, global individuals. And if you've peeked into that project, the quality of content and literature and expertise is phenomenal, right? And there's actually a section in there which I've uh, strategically 
uh, done a snippet of, is around metrics for managing risk in application security investments. Because being able to derive what is my impact or how do I calculate you know, an impact scenario for clients or business units or information owners, whatever, is really important. So you can factor this into as almost a, a procedural way to apply stage one of POST as an example. I wanted to talk about a real life case example. Commercial insurance company got hit, this is a long time ago, when I first started Versprite. And uh, this, um, this particular commercial insurance company got hit by Conficker. And they, um, they walked out this very big prominent consulting firm, the VP and the senior director. They just kicked them out. And they, because the, they, all they were touting was like patch management. You guys suck at patch management. You didn't patch and that's why you got Conficker. So, but they kicked them out. And it goes back to the messaging. So what happened was is that we came in, we, we listened, we, we obviously got what happened in terms of the t timeline of events for how they actually got infected. But we also met with what, what, what were these infected assets doing for the operation? How does this company make money? I just said that like 10 minutes ago. And then we correlated, we, we, this, the systems were down. So we unitized, the, what we did is we came up with a dollar unit value, which came up to be something ridiculous, like $650,000 an hour of, of opportunity cost, lost, lost revenue. And the, when we showed the numbers, we did the math with the controller, we showed it to them, it's like, hey, this is what we see as your cost. You know, you kicked out colleagues of ours in the industry for this, but this is, you know, if you don't improve your game in something that's really simple, right, patch management. This is what you're looking at. And this is what you're eating up right now. And the controller signed off on it, went to the CFO, the CFO signed off on it, and they launched a patch management process program. And you know, the point is messaging. You know, being able to, and this goes back to this slide, do you understand how to quantify impacts that you're actually addressing in your application threat model? Security coding guidelines, you know, you can mess something like this with that blind threat model I talked about, where you preemptively build security in. You could use the cheat sheets here. Uh, ASVS, phenomenal, phenomenal project. Um, the testing guide. So now we're going, you know, further up the pasta stack. You know, stage four is threat analysis. Stage five is vulnerability or weakness identification. There's a lot of great tools to do that, right? Zap is a phenomenal tool. Um, you could use multiple different uh, uh, other, I mean, a, a testing criteria like the testing guide. Uh, you could use, you know, in terms of tools, you can definitely use Zap um, in order to basically unit test some of the URIs, URLs for different types of, you know, um, different types of vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And you want to correlate those things like SQL injection, okay, information loss, what information do I have that is vulnerable from this, this component in my application? Do I care? Is it, you know, understand what information is at stake so that you can not go into somebody that owns the application and say, you got SQL injection. I owned you seven ways Sunday. You want to talk about the impact and say, you know, you're half a million records, all regulated, auditors up, up in here in, in a month, audit fees of, you know, half a mil based upon last year's, you know, or last time we, hit, we got hit with something like that. Talk about that. Don't, don't lead off conversations with business owners, application owners with SQL injection, numeric SQL injection, whatever. The OWASP W2F web uh, testing framework, which is actually built around you know, really good testing methodologies, like one of my favorites, the pen testing uh, standard, P-tests, um, is, is, is a great tool to basically exercise uh, layer six, which is attack modeling. Going back to thinking nefariously and thinking like a criminal, that's, I think that's, that's something that's always going to be a challenge. Um, but, you know, being able to not just be a tool monkey, but to think like a criminal and say, how do I subvert this process? If I, you know, how do I basically, um, you know, do a persistent level attack? and compromise the system? Or how do I do a privilege escalation? Because if I do a privilege escalation, that can get me to my threat motive. Thinking like that versus like, let me get my app scan, let me drag and drop my library of OWASP top 10 you know, payloads, and let me press the green button. 
That's, that's, what, that's what's happening. That's, we're still doing this. We're still doing this, and it's sad. So hopefully, we can all have a um, metaphorical, I guess, uh, awakening or spiritual awakening or uh, security lobotomy to start anew, to, 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 be, to begin to, to kind of like repackage how we are going to um, actually reduce risk, parlay risk, and leverage some of the tools that a lot of these people have volunteered their time and effort for. My Security Rule Set is a great project. You know, it's, it's been used by multiple different uh, vendors, and it's, it's highly effective. And you know, this week, I really wanted to go to that workshop, but it was a WAF benchmarking testing workshop or talk. I think it happened yesterday at 3.30. And I wanted to go to that one. And uh, because you can take you know, the Mod Security Core rule set, you can take this methodology for testing WAFs and add that as part of your stage six attack um, enumeration attack modeling for a, th a threat model. Attack, that, that attack phase is also relevant in other types of methodologies. Um, so you want to be able to operationalize these attacks and not just have them to be that they're theoretical. Because that's where you get into the probabilistic analysis. Were you successful, were you not? And that's how you can, you can basically substantiate your threat claims in your risk-based threat model. So this is the second to the last slide. And ultimately, one, another great project is OpenSAM. Um, you know, Gary McGraw was talking heavily about BSIM and the, the keynote I saw earlier this week as I was revisiting keynotes from OWASP, keynotes of past. And, uh, you know, if you're threat modeling, the important, th the important thing is, is, like anything in life, is to take it a step at a time. You know, what are your initial milestones? You know, do you simply want to understand your technology footprint? Do you maybe just want to get people to not throw their door in your face when you talk to uh, developers or architects as you come, you know, talking about threat modeling, kumbaya? So that might be a goal, but being, it, it never fails that when you get together with other people that are supporting, managing, deploying into the environment that's at stake, that's supporting the business, that if everyone is now operationalizing security and talking about threat analysis and talking about preemptive hardening and mitigation and countermeasures, then it's less adversarial. I appreciate everyone's time. If there's any questions, I'm more than happy to take it. But uh, it's been great to be here in uh, Orlando. Thanks to all the volunteers. Thanks to all the, the vendors, too, who make this possible. And uh, thanks to all of you guys for being here and supporting OWASP. OK. Hello. It's kind of the guy who has to switch off the light. I switched on the light after the last call, so they gave me the honor. I hope you enjoyed the conference. I hope you enjoyed last night. It was a really a blast to be here. For me, it's really weird. I'm from, as you hear, the slight European accent. To be at Disney World and see what you do. It was impressive firework, good food, good drinks. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, you're all tired, you don't want to spy, yay! <laughs> so this event was, unfortunately, is about to close down. We had a total of close to 800 registrations. We had 18 students or faculty members. We had 13, uh, 10 trainings in the first two days, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. We had 58 uh, talks. I hope they were really good. I thank you to the speakers. Great job having them here. Hey, speakers. Yeah. Yeah. All this is possible, and you know, everybody who is engaged in us by volunteers. Volunteers who do the call for paper review, the call for training review. We had, I think, close to 400 submissions for pa uh, papers. They all have been reviewed by th at least three. And they make the selection. You can imagine how much private time is going in there. So, and also the volunteers who are running here from the registration, at the room proctors, at the room uh, runners, everything. So, a big applause for the volunteers. <laughs> and as you know, I think for such an organization as we are, we have very small staff, 
and they make it all possible, our backbone, our operation center. So also a big applause to the staff who make this possible. I don't know how many of you go to other conferences of this size. We keep the price reasonably or as low as possible, and this only is possible with all the sponsors. With 41 sponsors, it's really great. The most I ever had, I think. Thank you for the sponsors. <laughs> now, normally, it's now the time to announce next year's UPSEC US. Unfortunately, we have not all details settled yet, but hey, there's also other countries outside of the US where people like me come from. So the next UPSEC, Global UPSEC Conference, will be in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in June 2018. <laughs> hmm? Oh, yeah, uh, that will come up. So we are just about, it's actually my fault because I was too busy here, the call for training and call for papers for that conference will open soon. Hopefully when I'm in the flight and can work on it. So it will open really soon, and when you ever needed a reason to go to Tel Aviv, that might be it. Submit your training, submit your talk, and who knows, you might be chosen. Actually, that's it. That's the light switch on. Oh. One last thing. Tom and Michael Coates, Josh Sokol, and um, Tobias Gondrum. This is the last uh, go on the board for a little while, and so I wish to thank them for their service and to OWAS over a long period of time. <laughs> So one more thing back on the numbers. Um, I think it's always important to have people understand what it takes to run a conference and what OWAS looks at this as a, a fundraiser. Uh, but keep in mind that you know, revenue from this particular event was about $660,000. Uh, we had expenses of approximately $520,000, so it's one hell of a party, isn't it? Um, but certainly I think no one would disagree that the space uh, would certainly allow for us to have a double conference of this size, if nothing uh, else. Uh, and certainly being able to raise visibility for software security and get more of our peers involved in the community is what we try to do at every AppSec. So, you know, as we had uh, issues with hurricanes and issues and things of, as leading up to this event, uh, please make sure that for AppSec EU, as well as your local chapters, as well as other conferences, that you get the word out, because having peers come here and hear the information is exactly what the mission is. So with that, thanks, guys. Sorry, I forgot. No, U.S. is all about the money. <laughs> it runs the world, I know, I know. Yeah, and I have to be more verbal and longer sentences to speak English, I'm sorry. Okay, but actually, last of these, I want to thank you all for being here. You make this a big success. Getting together, all your peers, all your interests, listen to the speakers, listen to us. Thank you.